Hello there, I'm Amira David. This is Boom Bust, and these are the stories we are tracking for you today. Well, it's another merger gone bust, this time between oil giants Baker Hughes and Halliburton. Plus, the man behind the digital currency Bitcoin has been revealed, and I've, I've got the details on that coming right up. Then Congressman Ron Paul's on the show. A new study indicates young people are rejecting capitalism in its current form. What's driving that sentiment? He'll weigh in. And then in today's big deal, Ed Harrison and I are talking China. How will the country resolve its debt problem all while avoiding a hard landing? We'll tackle that and so much more on today's show. Don't go anywhere. Boomba starts right now. Well, it's a breakup of Baker Hughes and Halliburton. The two energy giants have called off their $35 billion marriage or merger, I should say. In a statement, Halliburton CEO Dave Lassar said, quote, while both companies expected the proposed merger to result in compelling benefits to shareholders, customers, and other stakeholders, challenges in obtaining remaining regulatory approvals and general industry conditions led to the conclusion that termination is the best course of action. The blow up of the deal, which was announced in November, comes after a regulatory pressure. Regulatory pressure hit an all time high with concern that the deal would create an anti-competitive environment. The European Commission began investigating the merger back in January. Then in April, the Justice Department sued to block the proposed deal, saying the combination of the two biggest oil field services providers would hurt the U.S. economy and would hurt global competition. The DOJ estimates the company uh, the combined entity would control as much as 90 percent of U.S. sales. With Halliburton backing out, Baker Hughes now gets a $3.5 billion breakup fee, which the company says it will use to buy back debt, stock, and cut $500 million in annual costs. And moving right along here, we may have finally cracked the million dollar question in the land of Bitcoin. Who is behind the creation of the digital cryptocurrency? Today, the man that has been under scrutiny for several months as the possible founder actually outed himself. His name is Craig Wright, an Australian entrepreneur who says it's him that's been using the alias Satoshi Nakamoto all these years to develop that digital cash. Keep in mind, this is not the first time we're learning about Craig Wright. In December, two magazines, Wired and Gizmodo, named Wright as the possible creator after obtaining internal documents revealing his involvement. Hours later, uh, after those hours, just hours after those articles were published, Australian federal police raided his home and business. Authorities claim it was unrelated to the allegation of his connection with Bitcoin. They say the raid was instead linked to a long-running investigation on tax payments, but that has been disputed. In an effort to back up his claims, Wright did provide technical proof by using coins known to be owned by Bitcoin's creator. Other prominent members of the currency's development team have supported his claims. However, there are some skeptics out there uh, that today are asking for more proof. We'll continue to follow that story and bring you the updates. Well, love them or loathe them. Millennials have made it clear what they're willing to spend their money on. And in some cases, it's not cable TV. Another video service is seeking to capitalize on that, hoping to become the first choice alternative to traditional television. Boombas Bianca Vashini has the details. Instead of just re-airing television shows, Hulu may begin live streaming them as early as next year. If the plan does go through, users will be able to watch shows from a host of different networks. It's the latest move in the scramble to win over so-called cord cutters. Hulu, which is owned by the Walt Disney Company, 21st Century Fox, and Comcast, joins Dish and Sony in their attempts to push TV to the Internet. 
It's unclear what it would cost, but some analysts are estimating around $40 per month, near the same price of Sling TV or pay PlayStation View. According to the latest data, millennials are the only age group watching more shows on digital devices than televisions, and 72% of them are using streaming services, also higher than any other group. Because of that key demographic, that's where all of the ad money is going. Over the past three years, the total amount of money spent on advertising in digital video jumped from 2.4 to 4.4 percent. And 68 percent of U.S. marketing firms plan on spending even more money on digital video this year. This obviously spells trouble for cable companies who are trying their best to keep customers while not cutting their price too much. But it's a nearly impossible situation to control when the cost of Netflix is $9 a month, while cable can be as much as $150 or more. So if you're a traditional company that wants to keep those millennial customers around, it will probably cost more for you than it will for them. Oh, the good old cord cutting. We love talking about that on this show. Uh, tell me a little bit more about this. How exactly would this differ um, from the current online, online streaming services that it offers? Right. So, I mean, if you look at Netflix or how Hulu is currently, everything is already um, like pre-uploaded, and then you can watch. You can't watch it live. And so, if this uh, service is to go through. Hulu will be competing directly with cable companies because they will be live streaming shows that are being streamed on, on television. Wow. Um, and this is a big problem for cable companies now because it's not just you know competing with an alternative type of uh, entertainment. It's now you know if they steal something like sports, which is a very lucrative part of cable packages, their future could just be gone. Wow. All right, watch out, Comcast and Verizon. <laughs> They're coming for you. Okay, Bianca Vachini, thanks for that reporting. All right, moving on to some big news out of Puerto Rico. The cash-strapped island nation is defaulting on its largest debt payment to date. The island was scheduled to make a $422 million payment to bondholders today. But just 24 hours ago, Puerto Rico's governor ordered a partial debt moratorium, insisting that the island must prioritize its people over its investors. For more on that, we cross live to RT's Marina Portnaya in Miami. Marina, Puerto Rico uh, is more than $70 billion in debt. That's incredible. Uh, this mispayment is the biggest in a continuing series of, of defaults. And yet Puerto Rico's governor is partially blaming Congress for this fiscal crisis. Why are uh, U.S. lawmakers being faulted here? Well, Amira, for months, Congress has failed to agree on a debt restructuring bill for Puerto Rico. Now, the U.S. territory is prohibited from using the back bankruptcy code under Chapter 9 to abrogate, abrogate debt. Federal legislation is being proposed uh, for Puerto Rico's debt, uh, calling for the creation of a control board to help oversee and restructure some of the island's $70 billion uh, fiscal crisis. On Friday, with the debt payment deadline looming, members of the House went uh, home for a week-long recess, leaving the fiscal crisis crisis in Puerto Rico unaddressed. So on Sunday, as you mentioned, Puerto Rico's uh, governor, Alejandro Padilla, ordered the island's government development bank to suspend its $370 million payment, insisting the funds are needed to keep public schools and hospitals open. Padilla says his 3.5 million uh, residents come before investors and hedge funds, which he blasted as vultures. <laughs> Let me be very clear, this was a painful decision. We would have preferred to have had a legal framework to restructure our debts in an orderly manner, including those acquired by other governors with our creditors. But faced with the inability to meet the demands of our creditors and the needs of our people, I had to make a choice. I decided that essential services came before. Now, of the $422 million due today, Puerto Rico will reportedly pay $22 million in interest and $30 million to island credit unions. But that still leaves the island nearly $370 million short on the payment it is supposed to make. Yeah, that's a lot short there. Um, you know, missing a major payment could ignite a wave of creditor lawsuits. But how likely will today's default by Puerto Rico affect the broader bond market? 
Well, according to economic experts, today's default is unlikely to have a major effect on, uh, on as you said, the broader bond market. The bigger concern revolves around the larger and more consequential payments Puerto Rico must make in the coming months. On July 1st, the island must pay nearly $2 billion. According to the New York Times, roughly $800 million of that payment consists of general obligation bonds that carry an explicit guarantee by the Puerto Rican Constitution. Missing a major payment on that kind of debt could have a significant impact on America's $3.7 trillion municipal bond market. Puerto Rico has been warning uh, for months, even years, that it doesn't have the money to repay its debt. The island's economy has been in recession for almost a decade. Its poverty rate is above 40 percent. Unemployment is in the double digits. An estimated 1,500 residents leave the island every week, further diminishing the tax base. So this is a significant problem. Uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Jacob Liu warned today that if Congress doesn't restructure Puerto Rico's debt, the island will face a series of cascading defaults. Yeah, we talked about the thousands of people that have been leaving in yes. droves to go uh, to Miami, right where you are. Experts have mm -hmm. compared Puerto Rico's fiscal uh, crisis to Greece and to Detroit. Given how dire the circumstances are, why does Congress remain so divided on how to address this issue? That's a good question. Well, for the most part, Republicans oppose any legislation that appears like a free taxpayer bailout without concessions on pensions. Democrats are pressing for uh, greater protections on Puerto Rico's unions and workers. And uh, the island's governor has lobbied for access to municipal Chapter 9 bankruptcy, which Wall Street investors fiercely oppose since money was lent to the island when bankruptcy was not an option. What appears to be getting traction, though, is the establishment of a financial control board, with veto authority over Puerto Rico spending. But this issue is a very politically polarizing issue with most Republicans siding, siding with bondholders and investors who don't want to see Puerto Rico uh, restructure its debt to the point where investors lose money. But it is in nobody's interest to allow Puerto Rico to default on its debt because if that happens, everybody stands to lose. That is for sure. Everyone does stand to lose. So hopefully they can find some resolve on this very soon. RT correspondent Marina Portnaya in Miami. Thanks so much for that. Thank you. And time for a quick break, but stick around because when we return, Congressman Ron Paul is on the show. He'll tell me why he thinks more and more young people are outright rejecting capitalism. And then in today's big deal, Ed Harrison and I are talking China with slowing growth and mounting debt. The question is how to avoid a hard landing. Can it even be done? That's on the other side. Stay with us. What did you have for breakfast yesterday? Why would you pick those shoes? How fast is your Wi-Fi? What's your dog's name? Why'd you name him that? What's your biggest fear in life? Ever been on a hayride? When's the last time you read a book? What would you say if you ever met the Pope? Oh Who's the best quarterback of all time? What's one topping that doesn't belong on a pizza? Now, I've interviewed you too. Ah. Question more. You're watching an RT America special report. Man, it ain't about him. It's about you. It's about me. It's about everybody. Basically, everything that you think you know about civil society had broken down. There's always going to be somebody else one step ahead of the game. We should not be in the business of normalizing violence. We don't need people that think like this on our planet. This is an incredibly tense situation. For decades, the American middle class has been railroaded by Washington politics. Big money corporate interest has drowned out a lot of voices. That's how it is in the news culture in this country now. That's where I come in. I'm Ed Schultz. I do the news on RT America. I'll make sure you don't get railroaded and you'll get the straight talk and the straight news. Question more. Welcome back to the show. A new Harvard University poll shows that 51% of young adults aged 18 to 29 years old oppose capitalism in its current form. 
to get his, his insight on why this could be. Dr. Ron Paul's on the show. He's a former U.S. congressman, also former presidential candidate, and host of the Ron Paul Liberty Report. I first asked him if he thinks this poll is just politics or if he agrees that there really is something wrong with our economic system as it operates today. Take a listen to what he had to say. I think the problem is all in semantics. Uh, when they say they oppose today's capitalism, I oppose today's so-called capitalism. I don't even like the word capitalism. I like free markets. But if you say free markets and capitalism together, uh, we don't have that. We have interventionism. We have a planned economy. We have a welfare state. We have inflationism. We have central economic planning by a central bank. We have a belief in deficit financing. It's so far removed from free market capitalism that it's foolish. But for people to label it free market and capitalize on this and say, well, you know, it's so bad. What we need is socialism. That's a problem. It's a problem in definitions and understanding of what kind of policies we have. I'm a champion of free markets but uh, not of the current system that we have today. I'm highly critical of it because it's designed to fail. It's designed to reward the rich. It's designed uh, inevitably to destroy the middle class and, uh, and also finance uh, some of the worst things in government, all the deficits with the welfare state and for the warfare state. So yes, it's failing. People should reject what we have, but they shouldn't reject liberty and freedom and sound economic policies because that's not the problem. The problem the problem is we don't have enough free markets. Well, actually, in that same poll, it says that Senator Bernie Sanders, a self-described Democratic Socialist, has been the most popular candidate for America's 18 to 29-year-olds. Despite the fact that he's now losing steam, as we've seen on the campaign trail, what does it really say to you about what's driving this voting pattern? Well, I think he's tapped into something, something that I've talked about for years and tapped into when I was a candidate, and that is to describe the frustrations and the evil and the nonsense of what we have. The, the problem be, with uh, Bernie and myself is that he sees it quite differently. He thinks it's too much freedom and too much capitalism, and I see it as too much government. It's too much of a uh, interventionist planned economy which lends itself to fascism. But the young people might not understand economics and what free markets are really all about and they don't understand central banking and uh, Bernie uh, doesn't understand that you have to get rid of central planning, uh, you know, uh, from the central bank if you want to help these people. But yes, I am not a bit surprised. It's a good sign that they're upset and they ought to be. What I have in mind is to show them the difference between what we have and what we should have. And believe me, it's not going toward this ancient tradition of government uh, socialism. We've tested socialism. Socialism is a complete, has been a complete failure. That's what the 20th century was all about. Whether it's the fascist system of Germany or the Soviet system of communism, it's all been a total failure. So you don't want to go toward socialism. You have to go toward property ownership, voluntary contracts, and individual liberty, and getting rid of a central bank. Then you might talk about a real alternative. But the young people have a justification. They're justified in detesting what we have because it has served the rich and it has really hurt the poor and the middle class. Some would argue that the, the data does signal a generational shift is underway here in which more young people are receptive to bigger government rather than smaller government right now, at least in this moment. Um, and the issues that young people care about right now are low wages, jobs, student debt, income inequality. But I'm sure you would argue, as you're, as you're telling me now, sort of, that libertarianism can still best tackle those problems. How so? Well, uh, I don't think the young people would. They might uh, be sucked into believing that the government can give them a temporary benefit by raising a wage, but they just need a better understanding. But they're not for big government when it comes to their personal liberties, their sexual habits, their, uh, you, you know, the uh, civil liberties that they like. They like their privacy. So I don't think they're looking for bigger government. The young people I talk to, they're not looking for bigger government and more militarism. They're not championing the person that wants to spend a lot more money on military and rebuild the military. That's all big government. But yes, they're tempted because of this lack of understanding to go along with bigger government when it comes to trying to have a better economic system. But this is a, a result of uh, 100 years of 
teaching our young people that government is necessary to redistribute wealth, and they do. They redistribute wealth. The more they try, the more the wealthy get wealthier. It redistributes it upwards, and it ruins the middle class. That's what they have to understand. But uh, they're on to something, and they should be justified in looking at this. But uh, as a group of people, the millennials are not looking, you know, for more government. Only in that economic sphere are they tempted to look at this. But they're like so many others who declare themselves libertarians. They want less government in their lives, and they want more privacy, and they want less wars. Well, that, re that message was very receptive in, in 2012. I mean, what's so interesting to me is that when you ran for president, uh, what was it, just four years ago, you re were really the candidate known for bringing out scores of young people, for having a message that resonated with young people. Uh, your argument that fixing the economy really sort of begins with fixing foreign policy very much resonated. My question is, where did those voters go? Do they still exist? I mean, and, and if they do, where did they go? Who's the candidate in the race getting your supporters? Well, I think a lot of them are sitting on their hands, and rightfully so. How could they pick somebody that would champion those same views? But some who are just uh, loosely connected, not well informed, and get lulled into believing that we have to have a super military force to rule the world and police the world and be occupying these countries, yes, they get tempted to go along with this. But the, the true believer in a free society, they're, they're not chomping at the bit to uh, uh, champion the cause of any of these uh, uh, candidates right now. Uh, well, but it is some true of those supporters that have, of have likely gone uh, over to Donald Trump. We know that has to be the case because he is the front runner uh, on the GOP side. Um, the economy is still the most important issue for voters, and he's been most vocal about amending NAFTA, reducing taxes, building a wall. Uh, between the U.S. And, and Mexico. What, what is it really, do you think, at the end of the day, what does it come down to for Donald Trump and his economic policies that, that voters are finding so appealing? Yeah, he, uh, he has a personality, he has a megaphone, and he's getting the attention, and you don't have anybody in particular out there talking about the real economic issues. But he's regressive as all get out. He's going backwards. He's going to the dark ages of thinking that he can go into mercantilism and protect natural resources and put on tariffs and uh, just bash, blame everybody else, blame the Mexicans, blame the Chinese. I mean, that, that is going to be devastating to the economy. It has nothing to do with freedom. It has to do with the opposite. It is an exaggeration of economic planning that we already have. So he's going in the wrong direction, just as Bernie is. Even they're both tapping into the uh, disenchantment that the young people, a lot of people have with what's happening. Big deal time. I'm sitting here with Ed Harrison. We're talking China. For a number of years now, we've been talking about the potential for a so-called hard landing and what that would mean for the global economy. Despite once being called the manufacturing hub of the West, in recent years, growth in China has waned and it's now uh, growing at its slowest rate in 25 years. Now, China is trying to move away from the export-led infrastructure heavy model that brought the country to prominence. And the question is whether it can do that without causing the economy to slow even further, prompting worker unrest, or even worse, perhaps the end of the world. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm being facetious. But, Ed, let's talk about China. You know, you and I have been talking about it all day. Paint me the macro picture right now uh, regarding debt, regarding growth in the country. Yeah, so one of the reasons I'm happy to talk about this, and I think that we are talking about this, is because of the piece that George Magnus wrote in the FT, an opinion piece, at the weekend. And basically he was saying that the debt reckoning in China can't be put off. It could, you know, it could be uh, delayed for a couple of years, but, you know, three years is the most that he was going to give it. I'll give you an example here. China's domestic debt is poised to reach 300 percent of GDP, with 230 percent of that coming out of the real economy, 70 percent coming out of the financial sector and a lot of that debt is concentrated in local governments and also in the property development sector irrespective it's a huge amount of debt and 
some of that is going to have to result in a slowdown in the economy, irrespective of whether you socialize the losses or not. You cannot sustain that level of credit growth in order to continue, and they're going to have to slow right. down. Well, China knows that it's got to make a landing, right? It's, right? it's a matter of will it be a soft landing or a hard landing. They want a soft landing. The question is, how do they resolve the debt issue here and avoid the hard landing? You know, the only way for them to, going forward is to let the air out of the balloon slowly by uh, implementing measures that will allow them to do it over a number of years as they make the transition to their consumer-led economy. For them to try to, you know, rip the Band-Aid off, so to speak, I think that would be very detrimental. And given the level of malinvestment that they have in the economy, given the level of debt that they have in the uh, local government and also in the private sector, you would see a cratering in their credit growth, and that would lead to this kind of unrest that you were talking right. about right at the beginning. Is that what they're doing, by the way? Are they really letting out the air from the balloon slowly? Yeah, you know, one thing that I found really interesting, I saw today, Mark Chandler, he wrote an article about how the VAT was coming into play in China. Here's what he was talking about. He said that they're going to shift to a VAT model. You know, manufacturing companies have been subject to a VAT, but now they're going to bring it into the service sector. And this shift in the VAT is going to increase the revenue, the tax bill, by 500 uh, it's going to reduce the tax bill, rather, by 500 billion yuan. So it's sort of a stimulus of $77 billion equivalent, which is 0.7 percent of GDP. But at the same time, moving from a certain type of, of tax to a more consumer type of tax readies the economy for the consumption at the same time right. as relieving the overall tax bill for these companies. Yeah, so that seems to be the best way to approach this. But the question is, under that model, what happens to growth? What happens to capital flight? What happens to currency? I mean, do those problems go away? No, they don't. So I think that we're going to continue to see what we've seen before in the recent past, and that is, is that we're going to continue to see whether you call it capital flight or the need for uh, Chinese corporates to get some sort of a hard currency outside of the Chinese yuan because they've been borrowing in dollars. We're going to continue to see that. We're also going to continue to see falling commodity and oil demand as they move to a consumer-led economy, and that's going to have a concomitant, a negative effect on uh, people for outside of the economy. So, I mean, if you were to ask uh, what's the situation for the rest of the world, I would say that, you know, this fall in consumer demand is going to sap commodity and oil price prices, keep continue the downward pressure on emerging markets. But also, this is one thing to notice, when we talked about Apple last week, it's also going to impact the luxury sector because they're banking on growth in China, and that growth is not going to come. There's going to be continued slowing, and so there's going to be an impact both on, you know, basic stuff and also on luxury things as well. Well, one thing is for sure, all eyes, all central banks uh, are, are taking a close look at what's going on in China. They are following it very closely. Ed Harrison, thank you for that. Tweet at all of us, Edward NH, Bianca Pacini, Amira David. Remember, you can see all the segments featured in today's show on YouTube, youtube.com slash RT. From all of us here at Boombus, thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.